So you said the IWW could um, could provide that spark. Um, I feel that our at the moment um, we're so we're gaining numbers and we're gaining a lot of, of strength and power. Um, but I feel that we're we're very much la lacking a certain um, level of of seriousness. Um, as in in terms of how the the rest of at least in the U.S., how the rest of the labor movement is viewing us. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel it, would be, it is a very difficult uh, feat to, <laughs> to go from being what, what, what we're doing now to really being a part of, of this broader labor movement in the U.S. Well, you know, the, the U.S. is different from uh, Europe and other countries, in this res other industrial countries in this respect, not Japan, but many. It uh, has a very, the U.S. is, to a very unusual extent, a business-run society. There are all kind of reasons for that, you know. No feudal background. Uh, institutions remained in place in Europe. They didn't remain in place here. They were wiped out. There's a lot of reasons, but the fact of the matter is the U.S. is an unusually, is run by an unusually class-conscious uh, and uh, dedicated business class. It has a very violent labor history, much worse than Europe. Uh, goes pretty far, you know. But uh, uh, the attack on unions has been far more extreme here, and much more successful. Uh, uh, there's also the prop the business propaganda has been far more successful. So anti-union propaganda is has been considerably more successful here than in Europe, even among working people who would benefit by unions. Uh, and those are all things that, in fact, a rather striking aspect of uh, business propaganda in the United States is uh, the demonization of government, uh, starting in after the Second World War, which were, I mean, the, the, after the Second World War ended with uh, radicalization of the population in the United States and everywhere else, and calls for uh, more uh, you know, popular takeover, government intervention, worker takeover of factories, all kinds of things. And business initiated a tremendous propaganda offensive. It's been pretty well studied, but the scale is, it surprised me when I read the scholarship, it's enormous. And it's been very effective. There are two major targets. One is unions, and the other is democracy. Uh, well, democracy means getting people to regard government as an alien force that's robbing them and oppressing them, not as their government. In a democracy, it would be your government. So in a democracy on, say, uh, the day when you pay your April 15th, it would be a day of celebration uh, because you're getting together to provide resources for the programs that you decided on. In the United States, it's a day of mourning uh, because you're, you're, this alien force is coming to rob you of your hard-earned money, the alien force being the government. Well, that's the general attitude, and it's a tremendous victory for the opponents of democracy. And of course, any privileged sector is going to hate democracy. So they won that one. And uh, uh, they won it in a lot of respects. You can see it in the, the health care debate. The, uh, they have managed to instill the idea that if, in fact, you take a look at the recent polls, majority of the population thinks that if the government runs health care, uh, they're going to take away your freedom because that's that alien force again that steals your taxes. At the same time, the public favors a national health care program. Uh, the contradiction is somehow unresolved. And in the case of the business propaganda, it's particularly ironic because while they want the population to hate the government, uh, they want the population to love the government. Namely, uh, they are in favor of a very powerful state which works in their interest. So you got to love that government, but hate the government that might work in your interest and you might control. And that's an interesting propaganda task, but it's been carried off very well. Uh, you can see it in the um, worship, worship of Reagan. Worship is the right word. Um, it's the kind of worship you don't find outside North Korea, let's say. Uh, the worship of Reagan uh, portrays him as uh, somebody who saved us from government, from uh, you know oppression, and so on. Actually, he was an apostle of big government. Government grew under Reagan.
He was the most uh, strongest opponent of free markets in the post-war history among presidents. Uh, but that doesn't matter. They concocted an image that you worship. It doesn't matter what the reality is. I mean, North Korea, probably, uh, most of the population believes the propaganda about the dear leader and so on. It's, it's hard to achieve that, especially in a free society, but it's been done. And that's the kind of thing that uh, activists, IWW, have to work against in the right on the shop floor. It's not so simple, but uh, it's been done before. You, you mentioned that um, that the the, uh, the business the businesses are are um, very uh, class conscious. Um, can you elaborate on that statement a little more? All you have to do is read the business literature. Mm -hmm. Like in the 1930s, uh, they were very frightened and they were concerned about uh, uh, the hazard to industrialists in the rising power of the masses. Straight Marxist rhetoric, you know, just values changed. And it's constantly like that, they're constantly talking about the masses, the dangers they pose, how we have to control them, you know. And uh, it, it's a very you know, they understand what they're doing, and they're very class conscious. Uh, they press policies which uh, uh, work for their interests. I mean, for example, the, the insurance industries and the big banks are absolutely euphoric now because they have, on the business pages, they don't even conceal it, because they've succeeded in coming out of the crisis thanks to a huge public bailout, even stronger than they were before and in a better position to lay the basis for the next crisis, but they don't care because they'll get bailed out again. I mean, you know, that's class consciousness with a vengeance. In fact, you know, the labor movement has occasionally recognized it. You may remember, I think it was around the late 70s, Doug Fraser, then the head of the UAW, uh, criticized the auto work industries kind of with uh, astonishment because he said, hey, you guys are fighting a bitter class war. I thought we were supposed to be cooperating. Well, sure, big chance they'll cooperate. And sure, they were fighting a bitter class war. And, uh, the union leadership didn't want to see it for their own interests. Uh, and then, I mean, the health is a good case. I, I mean, I mean, the health, it's been dis discussed, I've discussed it, others have, but the health care, the uh, United States and Canada have quite different histories with regard to health care, although they're very similar societies. And one reason for it, a main reason, is the union movements. In Canada, uh, the union movements fought for health care for everyone. In the United States, the same unions fought for health care for themselves. So if you were in the UAW, you had a pretty decent health care system, uh, but it was a compact with management. And that's a, a compact between collaborationist labor leaders and highly class conscious management. And you know where that's going to lead. So if management says it's the end of the compact, yeah, it's the end of the compact. You don't have health care or anything else. Uh, well, that's the difference between a socially conscious labor movement, more or less in Canada, I don't want to exaggerate, but more so than here, and an individualist oriented labor movement says, I'm going to get something for myself. You know, Sam Gompert's unionism, which the UAW followed. <laughs>